If you want to get growth in your economy, there's only two ways to do it. You can increase productivity or you can increase your population or both. That's it. If you don't increase productivity and you don't increase your population, you're not going to grow. Now, Canada has the most sane, rational immigration policy in, that I know of. Along, well, Australia's got a good one too. The U.S. sucks. That's a technical economic term. <laughs> and I mean, you at least let people come in if they'll bring some money to the table, some education. And so you're growing your population. That's good. You're increasing your productivity. That's good. Um, but a lot of countries aren't. A lot of countries are, you know, if you're in Japan, they're watching their, their population is actually shrinking every year. So just to stay in the same place, they've got to monumentally increase productivity. Um, another couple of thoughts. It's the multiplier effect. That uh, the most extensive research on tax multipliers is from Christina Roman, her husband, says that tax uh, multipliers are a factor of three. If you increase taxes by 1% of GDP, you're going to get a 3% loss of GDP over several years, over about three, four years. It's, it's, it's a reduction. Because, why is that? Because government money doesn't produce anything. Each $1 in, increased government spending reduces private spending by about a dollar with no net benefit to GDP. Now, remember this equation again. Well, we're going to come back to it. Remember the... Uh, uh, remember the equation that you know GDP is equal to C plus I plus G? In the short term, the Keynesians are right. If you increase G, it's going to increase GDP, but only in the short term. Over the long term, it reduces savings, and how you get increase in productivity? You get private money figuring out how to start a business, how to in, in, increase your, 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 your productivity in your business, and that's how you increase productivity. Government spending is basically spinning its wheels. Now, did we need the stimulus in the US? Absolutely. Was it the right stimulus? No. But it clearly had an effect in the short term. Now, I've written about this. If you guys haven't read this book, you, sh you should get it. Uh, this Time is Different by Ro Reinhardt and Rogoff. You can read the first uh, chapter and the last five chapters, and you get the gist of the book. And they wrote it that way on purpose because, you know, they recognize that everybody's not a, you know, kind of an economic wonk like I am. I will want to read the details and look at the numbers and take out my slide rule and, oh, wow. You know. um, but what it shows is that they looked at 66 countries, 250 financial crises, and the real key is where the debt is excessive uh, relative to income, as Fisher said, in the most important factor back in 33, and sure enough it is. And government actions, even involving sizable amounts of money, give the appearance of doing something, but in just the empirical analysis of what they did, doesn't really do that much. And increasing leverage to solve the problem uh, only leads to greater systemic risk and general economic un underemployment. I mean, pity the Greeks. Um, I mean, they, they, they dug their own hole. So what does Europe and the IMF want them to do? Borrow more money. So they're going to borrow more money, reduce government spending, Remember when I said in the short term, if you increase G, it's going to make increase GDP? Well, if you reduce government spending in the short term, it's going to reduce GDP. So what they're going to do in their march to Austria is they're going to reduce their GDP. They're going to go negative on it, which makes their debt to GDP ratio worse, which has got them in the trouble to begin with. I mean, they're, they're in a death spiral. Now, why are they doing this? Because if they don't borrow the money, they've got to immediately, you know, uh, get off the wagon. You know, no more alcohol for you. 
And what do we know about alcoholics? Tomorrow, I'm going to get on the wagon, just like diets. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm continually starting my diet next week, January, whenever. Well, at some point, the markets are just going to go no. Uh, you know, when the ECB finally says, we're not going to give you any more money, what are they going to have? They're going to have more debt, except now it'll be on the uh, balance sheet of the uh, European Central Bank and not on the balance sheet of the banks. So they're taking IMF money, your money, to bail out European banks. I know this makes you happy. <laughs> it just galls the hell out of me. I mean, we're bailing out European banks. Nobody helped the U.S. banks when we needed to be bailed out. We had to do it ourselves. So I, I don't feel really happy about bailing out French banks. Um, financial crises occur when debt is excessive relative to income, whether public or private or both. Duh. But that's when the crisis comes. And, and it happens when the markets it, it, it just say, we don't have any more confidence in you. Right now, the markets are confident enough to give uh, uh, Japan 210% of their debt to GDP. Next year, they're going to give them some more money, and it'll go up to 220. Two years from now, it'll be 230, because they're running about 10% deficits. They're borrowing 40% of their budgets. Think about that. 40% of their budget is being borrowed. Japan is a bug in search of a windshield. <laughs> and when their savings rate falls, and it's falling fairly drastically now, because they're getting older. They're taking the money from their savings and they're spending it um, on things like food <laughs> and other, you know, not essentials of life. Um, it doesn't make any difference who the debt is owed to. Whether you, I mean, some people say, well, we owe it to ourselves. Well, no, it, that's not what the data shows us. At some point, the game is up. And it, it could be, Russia, Russia only had a debt to GDP of 12% when you had the Russian debt crisis. Uh, I think Argentina was like 40%. It, it, there's no magic number. It just happens. And all of a sudden, it's July 2008, and banks won't lend to each other. July 2000, uh, uh, I mean, I mean August, May of uh, 2008, banks were lending each other. It was fine. Not a problem. The problem will be contained, said Mr. Bernanke. And then it wasn't. <laughs>